Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Big hello to all of you in the chat. I see you there. Welcome to all the members of the channel that are here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm Natalie, and this is Scientology Life After a Cult, where you will catch me recapping the news that has the internet buzzing during the week in the mornings and on the weekends. I also do interviews throughout the week. So when you do subscribe to the channel, make sure you hit that notification bell because in theory, it's supposed to send out a notification when I go live or send out a notification that I am going live. I've heard this. This is the rumor. And on your way in here, everybody, if y'all could just hit that like button to help us get out notifications, you would make my day. And I appreciate it. We are going to have a very interesting, fun conversation today. I'm going to be interviewing Jenna Miscavige. Some of you might know her and be familiar with her story, her book, her channel. Some of you might not, but we're definitely all going to learn a lot today. I have a million questions. We will probably only get to a fraction of them, which means we'll just have to do this again. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to say thank you so much to Gypsy Mimi for becoming a member of the channel. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys ready to go? We all ready? Oh, Jen Shaw hater. You got her book yesterday. That's awesome. 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 Jen Shaw hater. Is that the Jen Shaw from the Real Housewives of Utah? You got to tell me in the comments. Isn't that her name? You know what bummed me up? I'm, I'm sidetracking totally. I'm so sorry. She's the first real housewife in the franchise from Hawaii. And look what she does. Look what she did. If you don't watch the show, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But I was a little butthurt about it because representation matters. And she represented in a criminal matter. Anyways, peaceful activist. Thank you so much for becoming a member. Hip, hip, hooray. Well, let's get this show on the road, people. Let's bring up. I want you guys all to meet Jenna Miscavige. Woo! Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hip, hip, hooray. Now, I'm so glad that we are sitting down to do this. All kinds of people in the chat have already gotten your book or they're reading it. I just want to give a little, I want people to see that quick so they kind of have a point of reference of what some of what we're talking about. Jenna wrote Beyond Belief, My Secret Life Inside Scientology and My Harrowing Escape. It is an amazing book. Very well. Thank you. Yeah, very well written. And it just tells a story that is just, in fact, I want to go back again and read it. I got to remember, I'll just get a new copy because I'm like, I lent it to somebody. I don't remember who. <laughs> I'll give you one. I'll see you soon. That's right. I can get an autograph copy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And for anyone that might not know, Jenna is here on YouTube. You can find her right here at Jenna Miscavige, where she is going to be doing more videos and creating content and sharing. And when I tell you that you will miss out if you don't subscribe and follow her, I mean it. You will miss out. You, you will miss out. The ship will sail. You will be left behind. <laughs> <laughs> So I now probably what most people will be familiar with. Oh, and by the way, everybody, go ahead. If you have a question, put question in front of it and then have the question follow. Big thank you to Dip Me and Glitter, who's here. She's going to be modding and helping out. And I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat. I've got my eyes on you people. So behave, behave. Nancy's not here, but y'all still need to behave. <laughs> now, Okay, Jenna, the, the biggest thing, of course, I think when people think Jenna Miscavige, they go, wait a minute, Miscavige? Wait, what? <laughs> so David Miscavige is your uncle. Yes, that's right. He is my brother's, I mean, my dad's brother. So what, what is that like for you? What, what, let, let's start back in the Sea Org, actually, because you were, you were born, were you born, born into the Sea Organization? I mean, my parents uh, went back into the Sea Org right before I turned two. So, I mean, I might as well have been. They were in the Sea Org before I was born and then had left and then went back in, like right before I turned two. And that was, when was that? Was that when Miscavige was already in power or was that before? It was like right about that same time. Like that, I th think that's when it was just happening. Kind of that like mid to late 80s. Yeah, like 80, like 86. So. Yeah. 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 So you were two then? Yeah. I, it was just before I turned two. So I think we went back like the December um, before I turned two. I turned two in February. Okay. 
So at what point do you recall when you kind of realized that, oh, I, you know, being in the C organization, who, what, what your last name meant? Yeah. So I don't think I, I remember one time when I was at the ranch, which was a place where the kids were of Sea Org members uh, who were at the international base at international management. Um, I remember one kid who was my friend. He said, you know, that your uncle is COB, which is chairman of the board. And I was like, well, I didn't know what that was. I was like, what's COB? And he was like, it's chairman of the board. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, oh. it's just really, really important. He's like the boss. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. but then I, but prior to that, I had seen my dad and my uncle be on stage for events, but I didn't really see it. Like it set me apart in any way. Yeah. I would just, I would just be in the crowd and I'd be like, my dad's up there. My uncle's up there. And I'd be like, Hey, Hey, I, I would like yell and stuff. And then, but I, I didn't like, I didn't really think of other, if other people's parents were up there or whatever. Yeah. When you were in the Sea organization, when you were older and, you know, you did the estates project force, the Sea Org boot camp mm -hmm. and became a full fledged Sea Org member during that time, I really wonder like, what was it like for you? Did, did you, did you feel that you were treated differently? Cause in some ways it could be good or it could be bad. Right. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? Um, so I, I think it's like, it's exactly what you said. It was both good and bad. I think that people didn't go out of their way to be mean to me. They're probably a little bit too afraid to be overly mean to me, but people do make assumptions about you like before. So they either assume they're either like, Oh, I'm going to make great friends with her and I'm going to be so nice. Or they're like, oh, she probably thinks that she's all that. She probably thinks that she's better than the rest of us. And then they're kind of like <laughs> <laughs> jerks or whatever. And I think that, um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I always had the same schedule as everyone else. Um, I, I, it's not like I was like paid more or like any, I didn't get any specific special treatment. Um, but I do think that, you know, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe people were nicer to me and I definitely did get, um, like I was always under the watch of RTC, which, you know, RTC is like the highest level of, uh, the highest group in the C organization. And they're sort of like s scary people who watch over everything. And so I was always like sort of being watched by them, being interrogated by them and being checked on by them, um, which was, um, so it amounted to more scrutiny, but also those, those people in RTC were probably nicer to me than maybe they were to the average person. Yeah. Because of that, I would imagine that, and you've talked before and, and plus in the book, by nature of you being related to David Miscavige, it put you under so much more of a microscope. So when we talk about these interrogations, these security checks, they, it sounded like they were relentless. It wasn't just that they were done. They were overdone. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like the frequency of it and, and just kind of more on that. Yeah, definitely. So when I was 12 years old, I went to, uh, to Florida uh, that's where flag is. It's like basically like the um, it's where Scientologists from all over the world come to train. It's like a, the most important base in Scientology for delivering Scientology. And so I went there, I was on my own. My parents were still in California and I was in the Sea Org. And um, just from that point, like within a few months of getting there, I was immediately being security checked. My mom had gotten into trouble because she had an affair with somebody, which is not allowed mm -hmm. in the Sea Org. And so I was immediately interrogated for that without knowing what had happened. Is um, that how you found out about your mom's affair during a Scientology interrogation? Or were you told this is why you're going to get interrogated? I had no idea why I was getting interrogated and, and I did not find out why at that time. So it was actually my first interrogation and I went into 
like the session with and with uh, this uh, uh, this executive lady. She was in RTC, mm-hmm. and she was asking me basically if I was hiding anything. Mm-hmm. And it was since it was my first one, I was like, no. Mm-hmm. And then she kept asking me repeatedly, and I was like, no, 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 no. And then she started to ask questions that were like kind of disturbing that were like, did you kill someone? Did you rob a bank? I remember she asked if I had sex with my dad and I was like, I was like super traumatized. I was like, how old were you? I was 12. And for those who don't know in Scientology interrogations, it's called the murder routine where you come up with things that are so egregious, that are so horrific that the person just spits out what it is that Scientology thinks you are actually hiding. And this is a great example of the inappropriateness in the way that it's used with children. Cause at 12, you are a child and they're asking you if you had intimate relationships with your father, which is disgusting. So this, this continues on. And then how, how I mean, you knew nothing about what your mom did. Yeah. So then, so in that same, um, that same like um, interrogation, she wound up ending the interrogation because I, she was going to take me to HCO for no report, which basically means that I didn't confess anything. So now I was in trouble and, and she did. And no and, report, I mean, no report, if I remember my Scientology correctly, no report equals a condition of doubt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I wound up going back in an interrogation with another RTC rep and it got smoothed over, but it's just, um, you know, just like when I think back on it now, you know, cause it's when something happens to you, it's like, okay, I'm fine. You know, but my daughter is 12 right now. And I was 3000 miles away from either of my parents. Mm-hmm. I had been being told that I wasn't allowed to call my mom. Like I tried calling her and they were like, no, you need to stop calling her. Even my dad told me I need to stop calling my mom. I couldn't get a hold of her. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, this happens. They're like asking me if I'm having sex with my dad. So even just like the whole thing with the murder routine and being interrogated, there's so much more nuance even behind that, just being separated from my family, all that that was going on that just makes it so much worse. Yeah, it really adds that insult to injury. And given your, because of who your uncle is being David Miscavige, I would imagine then, and and tell me if I'm wrong, when you were interrogated, it had to be by some of the top interrogators in Scientology in the Religious Technology Center, because what they thought you knew or what you might say, they wouldn't want going, you know, being heard by somebody who maybe was just doing an internship or at a lower level organization because these secrets could not come out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was usually always by somebody in RTC or CMO, Mm -hmm. which is another high level organization. Yeah. (laughs) There's so many. It's like, (laughs) it's so annoying that we have to explain RTC and CMO, not annoying that we have to explain it to people. It's just annoying that there's so many weird words that are so close to meaning the same thing, but it's like, how do you differentiate? (laughs) That is part of the brainwashing and the mind control is you create a whole nother language around it so that it doesn't, you know, in the same way that being open-minded outside in the normie world is a good thing. You're open to hearing other opinions and views, but in Scientology, being open-minded is not the right answer. That's right. Yes, that's right open-minded is bad. And I remember we'd also use the word like being reasonable in Scientology is bad. (laughs) Yes. Yes. That's the crazy thing is being reasonable. (laughs) It's a bad thing because you're just, you're not, you're not just being like standard. You, You don't have that black and white thinking. And that is something that, you know, what you just said there is actually such a big thing in Scientology because I don't know if people, well, many people who probably are watching are familiar with this the the reason why they change it is to, and they position being reasonable as this horrible thing is because you need to obey this black and white thinking of L. Ron Hubbard says this, it has to be this. 
Whereas a reasonable person might look for some type of a compromise, like, well, actually that schedule is not going to work for me. Even if Ellen Hubbard said we should do that, <laughs> they would say, well, you're being reasonable. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's an yeah. insult. <laughs> Lauren Blake says it, well, how dare you inflict reason upon the masses? <laughs> That is so true. So you go through this, you're, you're 12. That was the first time you were interrogated. From 12 to what time, what age were you in the C organization? So I left when I was 21. And in that time, I'd had like over 20 sec checks, security checks, interrogations, more than like 25 even. Yeah. Like just all the time. Do you think that the first thing I think of is that, well, one, do you know if these were being ordered by your uncle? Did you ever know where it was coming from? Did you ever question why you were having so many interrogations compared to your peers? Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't question. I did complain about it. Um, but um, like many of them, I guess, I knew why, I guess I would be told sometimes why I was getting them and like even, or like, just like for an example, when me and my ex-husband were getting married, they were like doing a type of confessional. That's like a role. It's called a rollback. So it's like, where did you get the idea to marry this person? So I knew that, I knew that that was why I was getting that one. You yeah. know, I knew that when my parents left, that's why I was getting that one, you know, and I knew I, some of them, I didn't know why I was getting them. Other ones I was getting for clearances purposes so I could go up to the international base. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, as far as if it was being ordered by my uncle, I mean, definitely. I mean, there's the OSA documents, which talk, which show that he was sort of behind all of the interrogation that I was supposed to be getting at that time. Um, and, you know, there were a few instances where, uh, Shelly told me that I was getting a confessional because of something I had said to her. And so <laughs> what it was, Oh, there was this, this one time when I had written her a letter and said, so when I went to Florida, you're supposed to do the EPF before you are a Sea Org member, mm -hmm. which is just basically a boot camp you do before you become a Sea Org member. I didn't do it because I was still a cadet. And so a couple years later, I was like, I really, I wrote her a letter saying, I really think, because we were in touch regularly, we always wrote. And whenever she was in town, I always saw her. And um, so I said that I think I should do the, the EPF because I feel like a fraud, like I'm in the Sea Org and I feel like I should do it. And then she wrote me this letter back and she was like, Jenna, I don't know why you don't think you have to do the EPF. Every other Sea Org member in the world does it. I don't know why you think you should get special treatment. You're going to get a little cleanup from this RTC rep, a security check, and then you're going to do the EPF. And I was like, <laughs> didn't you just ask to do the EPF? Yes. She like didn't read it. And there's no like backflashing that. I couldn't be like, yeah. um, you can't be like, you got this wrong. <laughs> yeah. And backflashing in the Seorg is basically talking back or sass. Any yeah. answer other than yes, sir, would be considered backflash and get you in trouble, especially at the level that you were at. So she misunderstands this and you have to undergo an interrogation about something that you were already volunteering to do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then another time when she, when Shelly ordered um, a confessional for me, she had, um, I, I was flirting with this boy who was a cadet. He wasn't in, uh, he wasn't in the Sea Org yet, technically. Mm -hmm. And she found out, or I had gotten in trouble for it. And then um, I had tried to call my parents um, because I was in trouble. And then I was like held down by like five people when I tried to make the phone call. And so I got into a fight about it and I wound up like there was a security guard and like three other women that were trying to hold me down from like physically stopping me from making the phone call. And then I had, so that was, I had gotten into a fight because I was like kicking and I like spat on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then they just, and, you finally are just like, okay, fine. <laughs> like, I'm not going to make the call. How, how does that situation how did de-escalate? De yeah. 
at that time, it was because Tom DeVocht, who was um, in, he was an executive at the time. He said, okay, calm, calm down, Jenna, come with me to my apartment. We'll talk, we'll talk this through and we'll sort it out and I'll let you call your parents. So I went with him to his apartment and we talked about it. And um, I did not wind up calling my parents. He said, he told me that he wasn't going to make me go do like heavy labor. But then the next day he changed his mind and tried to make me do that anyway. So that's how that de-escalated at the time. But anyways, after that happened, I was in an office um, where, um, and my uncle had passed through and I was in this office and I was supposed to be writing at my overts and withholds. And he was like, what are you doing in here? Writing your OWs? And I was like, yes, sir. And he was like, are you in trouble? And I was like, yes. And he was like, what for? I was like, well, I got into a fight. <laughs> and he was like, I can't believe you. He was like, you get, he was like, he said something. Oh, he said no more special treatment for you. And then he left. And then Shelly came in with a bunch of other executives, like this, the, the person who was in charge of my organization that I was in, the, the head RTC representative and like a few other people. And she basically said that, like, she basically like did like, I don't know, like 10 minutes of reaming me out and telling me that I was lucky to be able to get a confessional now and go through the program that I was about to be put through. And um, yeah, that I should be on the RPF, which was, which is Scientology's like, it's like the worst place you can go in the, in the Sea Org. It's basically where you wear all black, you do heavy labor all day, you um, get interrogated for five hours a day and you're not allowed to speak to other people unless they speak to you. So she said, I should have been on that. Because you wanted to call your mom and because you flirted with a boy. Yeah, I flirted with a boy. She said that because I was flirting with this boy, she said that it was one step down from having sex in an auditing room. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what kind of kinky stuff are they doing? <laughs> yeah. So... Did you realize, or at what point did you realize or become aware that many of these interrogations were because of who your uncle was? I mean, I think that I was always aware of that. I yeah. mean, yeah, by the time I was in, in Florida, when I was 12, I knew who my uncle was. And when I was, when my Aunt Shelley was there, I would talk to her. And she would tell me all the time, like every little thing that I had wrong with me or that I was doing, she would be like, well, that doesn't look good for your family. Like I had like, I, I had acne when I was a kid and she's like, you need to get this fixed because it's, it's out PR for the family. So I knew that it, that, that reflected on me or that reflected on them um, just in every little way. And even at that time, I was just like, God, I really just. I wish this, she even said, you know, or well, you need to fix this or else you're going to have to change your name. And she was being literal. I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming so. I don't know if it was like, it, I think it was like a threat from her, but it was like, sounds good to me at the time. I was like, yeah. less pressure, maybe. Yeah, it definitely that's an aspect of this that, you know, you think, I think sometimes people think right away, well, was there, you know, like you were saying special treatment and it definitely does not seem that way. So for her to say, or for him to say, for David Miscavige to say normal special treatment for you, you have to kind of been like, oh, was that special treatment? Does that mean we double down now on the interrogations? Did it, right. did you feel was it something that was just so normalized that you just felt like this is just normal, I'm going along with it? Or especially as a teenager at that point, did you feel any resentment about it? So looking back, and I've only just started to think of this directly, but I was any time that I questioned anything, I was always told by the RTC rep or whoever it was that the only reason 
I thought I could question that was because I thought I was special. Mm. And I thought that I deserved special treatment. And, wow. you know, and then over the years, that message actually like got worse to the only reason anybody likes you or cares about you is because of your name. This person isn't really your friend. Wow. And so it just, um, so I guess every time I questioned anything, which I was a questioner, like, yeah. Yeah, that is in my nature. It wasn't just it wasn't specifically just questioning things. I got up. I got bothered when I thought things were bullying. Mm. And I like wanted to stand up for people or things or whatever. I don't I'm not even like it's just the truth. It's the honest to God truth that would bug me. And whenever I did, it was just like, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. And that's just like kind of followed me like to where even now, like sometimes when I contemplate going on my channel, I'm like, who do I think I am? Like, why should I just assume that people want to hear from me? And I have to get rid of that because it's because yeah. it's bullshit. I mean, sorry, it's, it's okay. not true. <laughs> it's really not true. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's like results in me sometimes just silencing myself. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really harmful to hear that, like the whole yeah. time you're a kid. <laughs> exactly. Especially at that age where you're forming who you are and all you ever were doing was something that comes very natural to humans to question and be allowed to do that. And so many in the C organization that gets squashed even in Scientology. But the way that it was manipulated and done with you, it was just... It's extra cruel because it's not who you are. It is not in your nature to be that person and be, oh, I'm so-and-so, so you need to do this for me. It sounds like it's the exact opposite, yet you were treated as if that is who you were and that's why you needed to be interrogated and to kind of like take you down a peg. I don't doubt, this is my own speculation, mm -hmm. that your uncle and your aunt could see that you had some spunk in you and that you could stand up for yourself and they didn't like it. And try to train and and sec check and interrogate it out of you. And thank yeah. God they did not succeed because here you are. <laughs> right. Yeah. A selling book and now here on YouTube. So suck it, Scientology. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Natalie. <laughs> and everybody hates David Miscavige, right? Tell me in the chat. Tell me in the comments. <laughs> what do you think about David Miscavige and his treatment? Let's hear it. Let's see it. <laughs> And it's a piece of work. And Shelly Miscavige can go pound sand as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sorry. It's just next level. There, We hear yeah. all, we, we often, we hear from the ex-Scientology and the ex Seori community, the different levels that people go to in terms of abuse. And you just, you just, I know, I know that they saw that in you, that they know that and they wanted to squash it because that's often what they will do. And I think it's, it says a lot about, you know, and this is something I think a lot about with different Sea Org members as well, who survive and then thrive is you look back and think, or at least I've done this, like, what would life have been like without that? Like today, I, I, I can speak for myself. I'm just, I'm happy. <laughs> and I feel very much in the driver's seat of my own life. And I know what I've accomplished since I've left Scientology and what I'll still do. And I look back with some people and think like, how close, you know, why? I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is, do you ever feel like me where sometimes you wake up and wonder like how you're able to put one foot in front of the other? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Especially when I think back to like, af like how it was right when I left, like I was like, you know, in this whole new world where yeah. I was like kind of afraid of everyone and didn't know how to drive and didn't have any clue about my location at any time. Like I didn't, I never knew where I was, was on a map. And so, um, tell me about that. This is when you were at the international base. Okay. Um, no. So I left, from LA. So, oh, so I, well, what I was referring to is when I left, yeah. I, I, um, I just had never driven anywhere. I didn't really know where anything was and I didn't like, so I, I could get lost any turn I took around the corner, yeah. you know, that's like a really scary feeling. And, 
you know, the more, um, it kind of makes it where no, nowhere feels like home. If you just kind of never know where you are, you're, you're sort of lost everywhere or you don't even, um, yeah. So just when I left, that's how I felt. I didn't like know how to cook. I didn't know how to drive. I was at first, I was just still afraid of people who weren't Scientologists. I, I still felt like I had to hide something or I had to protect something. And, um, I also felt very different. Um, so I don't actually know why, why I was started saying that. I don't yeah. remember what it was in response to. <laughs> it makes perfect sense because it was like the exact thing that they were trying to prevent they were creating, which is no surprise because that Scientology kind of 101 seems to be how they operate, right? The idea is if we keep her inter interrogated, we can keep her in check and under control and, and you know use all the mind control techniques to get you to not question. And it didn't work. It didn't work. So how, I'm curious, how did it come about? How did you meet your husband at the time? And, you know, like, how was that allowed? Like, how, how did that come about? Yeah. So the way that I met my husband was that, um, well, when I was still in Florida, when I was 16, I started getting interrogated and I was under full-time watch, which meant that somebody was sitting outside my door at night while I slept and followed me around anywhere I went to the bathroom and all day. Um, I was cleaning bathrooms. And when I wasn't all day with a toothbrush, and then when I wasn't doing that, I was listening to these lectures from L. Ron Hubbard that were all about how any stray thought you think it is because you've done something bad. You know, the state of man Congress lectures. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was getting interrogated by like the head RTC rep for like five hours a day. So um, out of nowhere. And then basically after like a um, month or two of this, I was brought to LA where I found out that my parents had left the Sea Org, that I was supposed to go with them. They were in Mexico now. And um, basically at the time, I was like, I don't want to go with them. I had never lived in a house with these people. Uh, I had not spent any time more than an hour with them for the past four years since I was 12. Um, th they weren't there for any of my birthdays. They were never there when I was sick. They're basically like, I mean, my dad, I communicated with via letter, but my mom, I didn't communicate with hardly at all. Mm -hmm. Any letter she wrote me was shown to me by a uh, RTC representative in Florida. So I was like, no, I don't want to go. All my friends are here. And my friends were how I made do without, with not having a family. It's something I'd finally come to terms with. Like, mm -hmm. no, my friends are my family. I don't want to go. And so um, I was posted in LA um, and my ex-husband worked there. And, um, how, how old were you then? I was 16. Okay. Yeah. And while I was still in LA, I mean, sorry, when I first came to LA, I was still under watch by the RTC reps there. Um, day and night, I stayed in an office for two months where I had to do the PTSSP course, which is basically a course that you take that teaches you all about suppressive people. Mm -hmm. and all of their characteristics. It was essentially trying to tell me that my parents were suppressive people. Because your parents had left the Sea Org. Yes. Yeah. And I wasn't allowed to answer any phones. I had to get walked to the bathroom once again, and I had to eat at the table with the RTC rep, and I lived in a room alone by myself. And this is yeah. after you said you didn't want to leave. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. They still did this. Exactly. Yeah. And then I would still be like, interrogated intermittently by the RTC rep there as well. And then, so when I was finally given a post there, um, my ex-husband, he, he worked at that base and like, we kind of just like saw each other in the hallways. And then like, um, then when we'd be doing laundry, um, because in the Sea Org, you do your own laundry, but you have to do it after you, like go home at night, which is like already like at 1130. Yeah. And there's like three dryers for like 200 people or three washers for like 
200 people that live there. So you basically have to stay up the whole night to do your laundry. So we hung out in the laundry room together. <laughs> and that's like sort of like when we first talked. And then, yeah. Yeah. So you then, and in the C organization, there's not a lot of dating that goes on. It's mostly married. People get married. Right. There's just one, there's no time. And secondly, your, I mean, what happened to you earlier, just for even flirting with a boy, you were put under interrogations. Yeah. How, how did it, was there any pushback with you marrying your husband at the time that they didn't want you to make that choice? Or were you just, were you allowed to do it? So, um, yeah. So basically, yeah. In this year, you're not allowed to like, you're like only allowed to kiss. You're not allowed to have sex. You're not allowed to touch each other anywhere or else you go to the RPF, which mm -hmm. if you remember is where you wear all black, you yeah. do heavy labor all day. You get interrogated. It's hell. It's mm -hmm. the worst place. Nobody wants to go there. So we were, we would like, we're, we were dating. We would um, hang out after we came home. And then after like, I don't know, like maybe two months, he asked me to marry him. And in the Sea Org, it's like, like, well, of course you have everything in common. Why would you say no? Like, yeah. you're not wondering what their life goals are. You already know. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're not wondering where they live or what kind of things they're into because guess what? It's the same as you. We all know. Yeah. It basically just matters if they're cute or not. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Yeah. And also you get to have sort of your own room. Like, cause, so, cause you're sharing, cause otherwise you're sharing a room with like six other people. And so you get to have and your six own. would be nice. <laughs> oh, okay. well, it depends on where you're at. How many people did you share with? Initially before I got married, I think it was 15, 18 women. The bunk beds were mostly three high. There might've been a couple of fours. Oh my goodness. Three high just roll, just lined up one after the other. So there's many reasons why get and I was 17 when I got married. So you how mm -hmm. old you got married? You were 16 then? So I was 18 when I got married because oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So they wouldn't so then we said we wanted to get married and then they sa said that that's when the interrogation started like to asking if we had like gone out to D which just means have we like done anything inappropriate sexually that we weren't supposed to do. And then it, and then it became trying to ask him like what his ulterior motive for being married to me was. And then something came up that his uncle had like looked at a anti-Scientology website. And then it became months and months of trying to like solve his uncle's case. And then finally me and him, we, well, we just had sex before we got married. They wouldn't let us get married for a really long time. And I didn't feel bad about it at all. Yeah, Actually, but yeah, yeah. I didn't feel bad. He did. So he wound up telling on us and then we um, got in trouble and I refused to do what they said because I was like, no, this is your fault. You should have let me get married, mm -hmm. which on one hand is me sort of expecting special treatment, but I wasn't, I was like, no. The, the right treatment would have been you would let me get married because yeah, there's no I policy. Think a lot of people would think that too. So I would, I would disagree. I don't think that was you expecting special treatment. A lot of people would have been like, Hey, if you would have let me get married, I was trying to do, to do the right thing. You interfered yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that, Natalie. Yeah, no, <laughs> they are the a-hole, Jenna. They are the a-hole. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And so then they tried to separate us. And then it just became this whole thing of me like trying to find him when they separated us. And then, yeah, it was a whole ordeal. Was that then because you got married when you were 18, but you didn't leave the Sea Org until you were 22. Right. right? Yes. That's and, cool. Yeah. And we watched when you did the live with Aaron over at growing up in Scientology and, and some of the, in the live chat too, your nickname comes up on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> because there was an incident where you were being prevented from what was it leaving a room i mean you yes. had to invite somebody to get away yeah yeah right yes that what happened was there that was towards the end of when i left it was just like i mean so even at the point when i was just talking about with my ex-husband dallas 
-hmm. that's this is like five years later i mean just imagine how many interrogations took place between then and then but five years later like all the time there i was never not getting interrogated yeah so just by that time um i guess when you're in a in an interrogation there's this sort of agreement between you and the person who is interrogating you and it's kind of like you have to have your needle flow at the end of it in order for you to get out of there mm -hmm. but you have to give them something but and so i felt all along i had been feeling bad for the person who was interrogating me like i was like okay she's gonna get in trouble if she misses a withhold on me or she can't get out of this that she has no choice but to ask these questions and then i guess at some point in that session i was like you know what like she doesn't give a crap about what's happening with me yeah and that's like i'm done with that i'm done like trying to make like thinking about her all the time and trying to make it easy for her mm -hmm. and i was just like like i was like she kept asking me you know has a whistle been missed I was like, no, nope, I'm done. I, I just couldn't deal with it anymore. Like it was, yeah. it sounds crazy because it's something you expect when you're there. But I was just like, it, there was something physically that came over me that I was just like, I will not take a single additional second of this. Yeah. And I was like, so I'm going to leave. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I'm not trying to get into a fight. I don't want to get into a fight. I just don't want to be, have that ha happening anymore. Wow. And then she stopped, tried to stop me as I knew she would. And as I had many times before, usually I would feel bad. They have no choice. You know, they can't let me leave. They'll be in trouble. Yeah. Them, them, them always thinking about them. And at this point I was like, but, but she's not thinking about me. So yeah. I'm out of here. Like, I, I don't care anymore. I can't think of every, every other person besides myself all the time. Yeah. And so then it just escalated me trying harder and harder to get out of the room. And then there's like biting and kicking and throwing of my PC folder and um, just like yelling and then finally escaping and then running down the back stairwell. There was someone who was, who was racing to get there before me to stop me at the bottom. And I just like barely made it outside in time in time. And it's all super ironic and stupid because there's nowhere for me to go. <laughs> like where am I gonna go? I my parents aren't there. Like I don't even have a phone. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I was outside on the street, and then they were and they were chasing me as they did. If I was like, leave me alone. If I shouted. If I did anything that looked bad. And that's the only time. I um. So no, it was at the HGB. Okay. Yeah. So where where if you guys watch the protesters, it's where they go to watch the big buses. Yes. Yeah. So it's on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. And where the test center is, is where I lived. So when I go to the protest there, I'm like, oh, it's my home. Yeah. Because <laughs> I lived there for like four years. Wow. So tell me this, you finally, you get out of the Sea Org finally, right? And you are out. The first time you go out into the world, when you know you're free from the Sea Org. What is going through your head? What's the first thing you want to do? Or was there like, what, what were your thoughts? Because it's, I know I can, all I have to compare is like my leaving Scientology experience, but I was already living out in the world with other people. Right. Were like Rapunzel all up in there being held captive pretty much right. and being interrogated the way that you were. And now you're free. Right. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to be honest. There was no relief. It wasn't like I left and now I'm free. It was like I left and now I'm on my way down. My only relief was that my ex-husband was with me because they put in a huge amount of effort into stopping that from happening. Yeah. And that was all I had. Yeah, exactly. And they knew that. Yeah, they knew that. And they didn't have to. Like they didn't, they didn't care about him. They mm -hmm. just did it to hurt me even more. Yeah. And That's so, um, so they failed at that. I guess they failed at it and he wound up coming with me, but to be honest, like, I don't know after that, if the, 
if the marriage was ever, ever really came back from that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so we went straight to his family's house who were Scientologists who were just immediately like his dad, like his mom was happy to see us. I don't, th I think his mom was probably like, did like was just happy regardless. His dad was immediately planning on how to get us back there, how to essentially keep his status as a Scientology member and how this, what this was going to do to him. And just looking back, it's just like such a, it, it's just like the worst case scenario for someone who finally gets smart enough and brave enough to free themselves from a cult and has the miracle of making her husband go with her after fighting for it, then like, are you kidding me? Then we have to go to the house of somebody who is like almost 50 years old, is like rich, lives in the outside world. This privileged person who wants to keep his status is telling that 21 year old person to go back to the cult. Yeah. It's just like insane. Yeah. How long before you guys were, you were then on your own? Was there ever, ever a period before your divorce where you were kind of free from that as well? Yeah. I mean, we moved out about six months later. We moved out of their house about six months later, but we were living there and we were working at their jewelry shop. But at the jewelry shop, they wrote KRs. They did conditions. There was a big org board. It was all run on WISE, which is... Um, World, World Institute of Scientology Enterprises, L. Ron Hubbard's administrative technology. So they were full-blown Scientologists using Scientology in their business as well and had Scientologists working for, for them. So you were, you were out, but you were not out. <laughs> right. And actually, there was a few Scientologists that worked for them, but the majority were not Scientologists, but were still being made to write up their OWs, do danger conditions, to keep stats and all that. And many of them were very uncomfortable with it. Yeah. In fact, they had some lawsuits at the company about it. Oh, because of that, forcing Scientology on people. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was really uncomfortable because the person who, so like the executives were all Scientologists and like he, he was trying to like give me an auditing session, like during the day when I was supposed to be doing my job. Like they were just always trying to handle me. So it was all day, all night at home. And so finally we moved out about six months later. Cause you weren't, you weren't declared a suppressive person when you left the C organization. I was not immediately declared. No, before well, we were trying to prevent. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, Osa was just all up in his parents' business. They were having us followed by PIs they were like, even after we moved out, they were, they inserted someone into our lives who was reporting on us. And um, they were just constantly threatening Dallas's family with basically kicking them out of Scientology if they didn't disconnect from us. And then, you know, as a favor to Dallas's father, we wound up going to LA to get a committee of evidence. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I was, that's that, you know, yeah, the thing you and Aaron went over, which is like a court martial kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. After all that is done. Is that were you? I, I don't remember. Were you both declared at that point? Well, we were not declared at the end of it. It um, didn't. It didn't. We didn't wind up getting declared from it. Okay. It's. I actually still have it on my desk. <laughs> so it's. Um, yeah, so it recommended that we be declared suppressive persons, but then it says it's mitigated. It says, based on the fact that Dallas and Jenna appeared before and cooperated with the committee and also expressed that they do want to resolve their situation per policy, the above recommendations are mitigated in order to give them a chance to take responsibility for their situation. And so it says we're dismissed from staff. Which you had already left. Yeah, we'd already left. You there, whenever that. people leave, they're always like, you're dismissed. It's like, <laughs> we left. And then, then it says we're freeloaders. And then I think it came with a bill. 
and then we're assigned a condition of doubt and we have to do 250 hours of amends each. And then we have to complete um, an interrogation. Surprise, oh, surprise, God. before we do more Scientology. So I'm going <laughs> to assume that that wasn't done. <laughs> that was not done. In fact, just like before we went and did the interview that we had to do with that, it was just like such a huge point of contention. And the whole time I was there, I was like, not guilty, not guilty. I was just like, F you. Does that count as a swear word? F you. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, F you, F you, F you yeah. to everything. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just like the last straw. It really, I keep, it was the last straw, but to honestly, like there was like a million straws before that were the yeah. last straw. I don't that know how I didn't go insane. Yeah. <laughs> That tends to be the way it goes is it's not always just one thing. It's just so many things. And then you just finally break and the desire to leave and be free becomes stronger than anything that you could possibly lose. Yeah. At that point, when you get to the point where you no longer have anything to lose when it comes to Scientology and they push people to that edge, mm -hmm. if they would just let people go, mm -hmm. you know, I was one that just was going to leave quietly. And mm. now look, Scientology, <laughs> I have a YouTube channel and it's growing. And I talk about <laughs> you every day. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. They really just push it so much farther than they need to. They do. They do. That's tell awesome. me about, tell me about writing the book. What was that like for you? Because you, how long had you been out before you wrote the book? So I came out at the end of 2005 mm -hmm. and the book came out in 2013. So I actually had been speaking out about Scientology for many, many years before the book came out. There was the ex-Scientology Kids website and I had been on like Nightline and some TV things. That's how I got approached for the book deal because I was, um, because they saw me on TV. And so the process of writing the book, um, I had been writing for years. In fact, from the moment I came out, I started writing, which I'm really grateful for because I wouldn't have remembered a lot of that stuff um, many years later. Um, but yeah, so basically it, it was sort of rushed because they wanted to get it done fast because basically the longer it takes, the more time there is for Scientology to find out about it and to cause yeah. trouble. Sure. So, um, yeah, it was just basically me writing chronologically what had happened in my story chapter by chapter, sort of like, just like getting it out of my system. And it was both like disturbing because it would put you back into many situations that, that are like sad and scary and where you feel like you have no control. And also it would, um, it would, it was good because it would help me remember everything that happened. It helped me to understand myself a lot more. It helped me understand why I did a lot of the things I did and what had happened. Because I think that when you're in a cult, a lot of people, block out their memories because there's so many um there's so much cognitive dissonance that it's almost like you have to block certain things out in order to move forward yeah and so the process of forcing myself to go back and remember everything was really therapeutic and also like it um yeah it was just both and then you know once I went through it once then me and the gal who helped me uh, with writing my book would just go through it again and um, make sure we added like feelings that were happening, you know, fixed grammar, um, made sure that there was a point, made sure to remove like extraneous information that wasn't needed. And um, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like when, because you were out already when your grandfather, David Miscavige's father, left and escaped from Scientology with his wife. So he he left. They escaped. He also went on to write a book. Did you have contact with him after he left? 
So he immediately left to my parents' house. So I had contact with my parents and like they would tell me about him and I would hear, but I, we didn't like, he and I weren't close. Mm. And I think that when he first came out, I was like the big bad SP who had been talking about Scientology for all these years. Yeah. And so I was like the worst of them. So, and he very much thought that. And then when I started writing my book, um, I did speak to him. I speak, I spoke to him about his backstory a little bit and um, he told me some of it, but he was also at the time, he was very much like, but don't make this sound bad. Don't make Scientology sound bad because it's not bad. And then, you know, the longer he was out, the, the more his opinion changed. Yeah. And then we were in touch a little bit, but we were never extremely close. I mean, he, I saw him once after he left Scientology. Yeah. At any time, whether it was when you were writing your book or when you were doing media, because, I mean, you weren't just like at your local news channel. I mean, you were doing national press before you wrote the book, after you wrote the book, for sure. Did you ever have any concerns about your safety in regard to your uncle? Because, I mean, David, Scavage, David Miscavige is the same man who was having private, private investigators follow his father. And these private investigators followed him to, a, I think it was a grocery store parking lot, and thought that he was having a heart attack. They contacted David Miscavige slash his people, him, and asked, what, sh what should they do? Should they call paramedics? Should they intervene? And he said to do nothing. That if it's his time to go, it's his time to go. I mean, just cold. I mean, your right. grandfather's book was called Ruthless, and it was yeah. about his son. Right. Did you ever have any concerns about, you know, your safety? You had already been followed earlier. So it might just seem like we, Aaron and I talked about this the other day, how we have normalized being followed by private investigators and don't even consider it being fair game to harassed. <laughs> That's so true. It's so true. Like, no, it's no big deal. That's just a PI. They're not going to do anything, but it's like, no. That's weird. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's not normal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I did have, I did have concerns about it. I thankfully at the time, my workplace, they knew everything about Scientology. Nice. I had told them and um, they were really supportive. And so it wouldn't have really mattered yeah. if Scientology tried to say something there. And then I think um, I did worry about it. With my book deal, I did make sure that um, I was protected legally. Yeah. Um, you know, if I could, I was going to do that. Because many people over the years um, with Scientology, speaking out about Scientology, you know, they'll do so on a show and everybody else will have protection, including the show and not them. And um, yeah, I feel like that's kind of one of those things that we're used to. Like we're used to not not being protected. I mean, now we're kind of all protecting each other yes. by speaking out, but that, that was not the case no, at no, all. No. When you left and you were speaking up uh, about Scientology, and I think that for everybody who's joining us or watching now, or you watching this on the replay, you got to recognize it wasn't the landscape we have today where we have much more safety in numbers. We have so many people never in Scientology who have our back and who are out there raising awareness about so why Scientology is a human trafficking cult. She was out there alone doing these things. You know, I'm sure you had other people that you were connected with out there, but it wasn't like it was today. And you still did it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There were a few other people, but it, yeah, it just wasn't like it is today. So now it's wonderful. There's so many people. We are all corroborating each other. We all have each other's backs, which is amazing. And I do think I had some level of protection, although I only because it would look bad on them because I grew up there. Yeah. And I, I don't know, maybe because I'm a woman. The ones anybody would be looking at. <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't, it was a huge priority for me not to mess up. Like, what do Don't you mean? Be, like, so I feel like when many people come out of the Sea Org, they're like, go oh, get drunk. And they like, go, they go experience all the things that they never did before. Yeah. You know? And I was like, I can never do that. I will never, ever put myself in a position to be compromised by Scientology because, 
And by the way, that's not healthy either at all. Yeah. Is that something that you've moved beyond? Have you a flown little bit flag, Jenna? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a tiny bit, but like that's its own, like that's like a after effect of leaving. It's like, you better be perfect or else that's going to get used against you. Exactly. Exactly. And exactly. That is the fact that that was done to you the entire time, you know, when you were growing up in those formative years, it was all about this, this idea of having to fit this mold of this BS family that was doing way worse than anything that you could have ever done. And I get what you're saying. Yeah, and, true. you know, yeah. And being out as long as you have now and writing the book. And now I love that you're here on YouTube because not only is it going to be beneficial to people to not just hear your story, but there's so much more to you and what you're doing than even, you know, than your past. I think that's true with any of us. And there's so much that you bring to the table and want to do. I think it's, it, that just helps. You know what I mean? It helps the whole thing for people to see one of the biggest fears in Scientology, especially for Sea Org members. We're told that if we leave, we are degraded beings. We are the lowest of the low. We will never su su succeed or be happy. And I love when people who leave Scientology are public about it in large part so that the Scientologists can see, hey, we're actually doing pretty good. <laughs> True. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But there's that pressure like don't mess up because they're watching and they will use it against you. They're, they're just waiting for you to mess up. Here's the beautiful thing though, that I've come to learn in being out in the, in the never in normie world outside of Scientology, everybody messes up. Everybody at some point does some dumbass thing and yeah. that they're embarrassed by or whatever. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Nobody really cares. I mean, most people are, we're all caught up more in, you know, watching ourselves. We overthink our actions and what we say so much more than anybody else does. And one thing I've learned with my, my friends who have never been in Scientology, and I continue to learn today is there's forgiveness and grace here. You know, the fact that you grew up the way you did and you you even felt the pressure that you had to be perfect so they couldn't use it against you. If anyone has a right to go crazy and fly her freak flag and do whatever she wants, it would be you. <laughs> but here's the beauty of it. They can't use that against you. What are they going to say, right? Like, let's say yeah. if I went and I can't think of anything absolutely crazy. If I went, <laughs> I decided to become an exotic dancer at 53. <laughs> well, the embarrassing part would be that it's at 53. Probably not a big audience for that. But let's say I did it. What is Scientology going to do? Who are they going to tell? That they, they just, it doesn't matter. And being around people, the more people that I know I've met where if anything else, it'd be an interesting story of parties that I took up exotic dancing at 53. You know, I really <laughs> feel like I could work with that. <laughs> totally. It's so true. Yeah. And I feel less that way now, but I was just kind of used to sort of feeling that way all the time as a kid. And I didn't feel any big need to do anything crazy because I was already allowed to do so much more than I had been allowed to do. Yeah. So that was kind of enough. But. Yeah, the perspective of it to even probably staying up or watching movies during the day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> feels like an act of rebellion because I know totally. that it was for me and working my way up through even, you know, within two years of leaving Scientology, I got a divorce and my mom had passed mm -hmm. away. And it it's it's this constant evolution because life still goes on and you learn new tools for de dealing with things. But I know that one of the biggest things for me, and hopefully you'll come to see this more and more too, number one, there's nothing Scientology can do. Nobody cares. Nobody's listening. They're like just this like yappy, pitiful dog in the corner <laughs> thinks that the world revolves around them and that they have all this power. They might have a ton of money where they can hire PIs. The things they do make them look culty. That is the whole thing I've come to learn. Nobody cares. You're not, we, we're not going to be judged if we're the ones being followed by Scientology. 
They are. That's so true. Yes. We're not the ones who are going to be judged if Scientology goes out there and says a bunch of BS things that aren't true or are true that they think are so scandalous. It's like, it is not 1950. What you think is so scandalous. Oh, you kissed a boy. Oh my gosh. I got sent out of the state for that when I was 13 for kissing a boy. I mean, the things, even what you're talking about, none of these are scandalous things. Right. It's just that whole, I got to ask this, growing up the way you did, what has it been like to raise your kids? Because you have two kids, you know, who are, who are one's a teenager, one's a little younger. Mm-hmm. What has that been like for you? Um, it's um, a lot of things. It's been a little bit like, I don't know exactly what to model it after, but then I've found that like, not at first I didn't know this, but my instincts have been really helpful. I mean, to be honest, having gone through many hard times as a kid and basically being pretty much neglected, yeah, I actually think it's made me a better parent Yeah, and that like, I know h- how I don't want my kids to feel. I can see if they if I'm doing something that may make them feel that in some way, because I can read it on anybody's face and, um, and then I can just do better. Like, I'm just like super aware of it. And um, I don't know. It's like almost like from the moment I was, I started speaking out about Scientology um, and then I had kids. I knew that I would not, be able to forgive myself or live with myself regardless of whether or not it's moral or whatever but that if I in some way repeated the cycle like I wouldn't be okay with myself if I wasn't a good parent and so um yeah so I've I've basically like destroyed myself to be a good parent (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, probably went overboard in being the totally parent. overboard. Yes. Yeah, it's an opportunity to be the parent that you wish that you would have had. Right. Yeah. And I find that that happens often. And now when I see other people who are in Scientology who are parents and they're like, we just want to do such a good job. I'm like, and it's almost like I was trying to make up for what happened to me yeah. to them, but that didn't happen to them. It happened to me. Yeah. And so like I tell them like, don't, it, remember it happened to you. So don't continue to throw yourself away to deprioritize yourself and neglect yourself in the same way that you already have been yeah. for your kids. You can still do a good job. You just don't have to kill yourself and they'll be fine. Exactly. Exactly. Because you're also modeling adulthood for your children. Yes. That's the thing I think often sometimes parents forget that you're modeling yeah. what it's like to be an adult for your children. You're modeling what healthy relationships should look like. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's that I've seen parents get trapped in the, you know, staying together for the kids, which more years ago, that was more done than it is now. But it's like, then, you know, with the fighting and the this and the that, and kids aren't dumb. They feel it. They know. When I told my son, my girls were already out of the house when I got a divorce and I was telling my son, I thought he was going to be shocked like shocked out of nowhere about it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I kind of saw that coming. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I worked so hard to shield you from this. <laughs> they, know, they just know. And ultimately it's, we, it, you know, we just got to show them that sometimes it's like, if you find yourself in a situation that's not right for you, it might, it might be uncomfortable and some pain to change it, but then it'll both be my ex-husband. Both my ex-husbands are very happy today. <laughs> and I mm-hmm. am very happy today. I just talked to my ex-husband the other day. Oh, okay. it, it's just, you can still have this relationship. And I've always gone back to that, that I may not always do the thing that's perfect or that would be completely expected of me or that maybe somebody else would do. But if I can just kind of get it right most of the time, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, like, I don't know, 80% of the time and 20%, there's things I would have done differently as a parent because I, I changed as an individual too. Totally. You know, I would have been, I, I was definitely went too far on the side of trying to use fear 
with my children. One, because that's how I was brought up. Of course. And, yeah. And I didn't understand, even though I tried to be, and I did, I was a better parent and more present for my children than my mom was able to be. And even mm -hmm. then my mom was more present for me than her parents were. Mm -hmm. Her mm -hmm. upbringing had nothing to do with Scientology, but it was horrific nonetheless. Mm, and so Scientology was a better choice for my mom than what her life had been. Uh, at least that's how it seemed to her at the time. And for a yes. while, that was probably true until it wasn't. <laughs> until it went on and on for her. Yeah, on yeah. and on. So what do things look like now? You know, we talk, I like to talk to people too about like your life. You've been out of out of the cult for a while, but this is a whole you know, again, you're fine. You're, you're divorced now. You have your kids, you're, you know, you're on your, you're here on YouTube again. What do things look like for you and what do you want to do? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the things that you were just talking about that you learned, I feel like it took me a lot longer to learn those things. Like to me, the idea of getting a divorce, like two years after I left, I, I would have been like, that would have been a potentially a great idea at the time. But I was like, no, this is all I have. This is my family. And it just was like, just persisted. And then I would sort of like, just beat myself up if I messed up on stuff. And so it's taken me a long time to get somewhere close to where you are. I mean, I've, I got divorced last year and, and I thought it was going to be the end of the world. I thought that my kids were going to hate me. It was like, I did all this work to not repeat the cycle and now I'm I've, I've ruined my kids life and they were fine. <laughs> <laughs> all that build up. Yeah. I mean, and they're also fine because we've kept it cool. You know, like me and my ex are fine. We get along and, um, and my kids have a good life. They're, they're not in a situation where, um, you know, they're safe, they're happy. Now they get two houses and they get twice as many presents and they basically just milk it. That's what's happening. <laughs> um, <sounds> about right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's been for the better and um, yeah, it's just all been a learning process and like just a process of like letting go of control a little bit on how I think I have to be or how things have to be. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I have a little bit more freedom now. I have a little bit more time um, on my own, which I was worried about, but it's been great. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I'm excited for the future and um, yeah, it's just different, but it's just, um, yeah, it's nice. I mean, I, I have a lot of new friends. I have, um, yeah, I just wish I would have let go of that control of trying to be the perfect person and keep everything so perfect for so long. And yeah. it really was because of Scientology. I mean, I don't, not to blame everything on them, but it wasn't, it wasn't just because they would use it against me. It was also because I, if I felt like I wasn't, perfect or that that I was just everything they said I was basically and remember too that it's their idea of perfect it's somebody else's idea and standard of what perfection is right when I th I think the true truth about perfection is being comfortable in that being perfectly imperfect because there is oh. no such thing perfect is it's unattainable it's yes, true. exactly. Yeah, I know. And I realize I sound kind of like a dick when I say I was because I definitely wasn't like perfect in any way. And it was there are things that would be totally I wouldn't judge other people for but I was just yeah. so brutal with Yourself. myself. Yeah, exactly. It's so mean. And then when I would put like, you know, when I was finally coming through it, and I was getting some therapy, I was like, God, would I want my kids to be be in this situation like what I want them to feel like they had no other choice mm -hmm. and 
yeah, that's all. That's the lens that I'm using a lot right now is that like, would I want this for my kids? You know, what happened to me? What if that happened with my kids? Just put so many things in perspective because I'm not used to advocating for myself. I'm only used to doing it in an emergency situation where I have to like bite people or kick them to get out of the room. But on the daily things, I'm used to like just letting them go and being like, oh, this is fine. I'll just suck it up. And then they all build up to something like that. And so I'm just trying to normalize doing that in everyday life. It, and it often is on the little things that often is the case because I've experienced that too. I'll like eat something. In fact, there was something recently. I finally, I said to, I said to my Tony, I'm like, you know, he, he makes the most amazing food. I am so fortunate. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> I like suck at cooking. He's just so talented with it. <laughs> so he makes breakfast and he makes these amazing breakfasts. And I had told him the other day, I'm like, you know, I don't really, I don't really care for the guacamole with eggs, but I like avocado with eggs. And he looks at me, he's like, do you realize how long you've been eating guac? You've been eating guacamole with eggs. <laughs> I've been giving you because you never said anything. <laughs> you've been shoving it down your throat when you hate it. Well, and I don't because I like guacamole and I like eggs, but yeah. I don't like them together unless it's a breakfast burrito. <laughs> it's a texture <laughs> thing. They're yeah. both like mushy. You got to have. Yeah. yeah, I get it. They were two mushies together, and but. It was what would be given to me. Like I, I'm thankful that he made it. And, but so I know what you're saying and that's such a small example. And it's even yeah. something I've been out of Scientology for, for almost 14 years now and the Sea organization mm -hmm. even longer, but there's this, this idea, I think growing up in Scientology, especially, and maybe it's just growing up in like whatever your trauma, you guys tell me the never in Scientology, you guys tell me, do you experience this where, you just think that you have to make do with what you have. It, it's this like, I, I didn't know that you're supposed to have more than one pair of sheets <laughs> for a long time. Mm. Or I didn't know that you're supposed to replace your toothbrush. It was uh -huh. like yeah, given a toothbrush, that is your toothbrush until the end of time. Yes, totally. Yeah. And when you're finally like, oh, I can just order more on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, I feel rich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because totally. you're so used to making do with the crappy blanket that you were given and whatever, you know, whatever it is that long after I was out of that environment and had more control. And I think I'm starting to realize for me that it really has more to do with kind of like what you were saying, advocating for the big things, but not the small things, because in some way I felt... I didn't need to take up that space. Right. You're too much. I'm too, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. too much. I don't need to take up that space. And there's a time and a place. It's not like need to be like all about Natalie all the time kind of a thing. Of course. But I'm talking about what I think you're saying, which is like really often putting ourselves behind, behind, behind. And you see it with parents too, mm -hmm. where, you know, of course there's times when you need to put your children first. But there's times when the right thing for your children is to put yourself first. Oh, my God. That's so true. That's exactly that's exactly right. Yeah. And Especially it's if you're the, yeah, you're their primary caretaker. Your your sanity is is everything at that point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and I think that's something that is not unique to even Scientology because I've met other people and that has been sure. my biggest, I think my biggest healing has come from meeting and getting to know and learning from people never in Scientology. And the biggest thing, realizing that sometimes they're as messed up as I think I am. <laughs> right. Totally. Yes. You grow up in a cult, but you seem, you also can't go to Costco or Home Depot. <laughs> right. Totally. But it's also so nice to hear from those people too because in some ways they're like this sounds this is going to sound ridiculous but they're like kind of teaching you the little thing that you didn't learn from your mom you know yeah. like this is normal honey it's normal that this is hard and so that's really sweet when I like get really sweet messages from people that are like I've been through this too that's normal you know it's um you'll get through it it's just it's getting that like love that you kind of didn't or and and that wisdom a little bit 
Yeah, exactly. The little things I learned, even when I should have maybe learned it was, you know, and after I left Scientology, my mom died within two years and it's, that's kind of your go-to mm. and there's the internet and you can Google it, but it's like, I learned so much from my Tony. There's so many things that he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like it's okay to do this or have this or be spontaneous. He's mm. so spontaneous. And I feel like such more in that creative space. And I, I'm more on the regimented side because I think a lot of it for kids who grow up, whether it's with whatever the trauma is for us, it was growing up in Scientology, you really the Sea Org, there's so much we can't control that we end up trying to control things we have no business and then we can't let it go because you just feel like, well, if I don't make my bed, the world might stop spinning. <laughs> so for <laughs> me, it's actually can be a win when I don't make my bed, when I oh, don't, yes. don't do certain things because I feel so, like what you were saying, this feel like you need to do it perfectly. If you know how it should be done, that it should be done to that standard. And that's just not true. It doesn't always need to be done that way. And sometimes... The beauty is in the mistakes. Yes. Yeah. That's so funny that you said that, that it's a win to not make your bed. Cause like I, I let, I let it go. And like, I feel similarly with like, we were talking about this earlier, but like accepting help or accept, just accepting something from someone without feeling like I owe them. Yes. That's like, I, 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 I still have trouble with that. Yeah. I struggle with that one too. I'm getting better at it. It's it's that it's unconditional. We're not used to having unconditional love or unconditional friendships. It's always there's strings attached yeah. to it that it becomes even with even with our parents it was you needed to be in exchange as they say in Scientology. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, you know, I'm feeding and clothing you, you need to contribute. And on the surface there's nothing wrong with getting children to contribute and be part of that household, you can go in the exact opposite extreme and still mess a kid up. Right. Totally. It yeah. It need to be tit for tat. You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's a hard one for me, but it's not hard for me with my kids. That's yeah. what's weird. It's just hard for me. Yeah. You don't put that same thing on your kids. Blow drill saying, wait, you can get another toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Ellen. laughs> that I think is some of the most fun things about being on YouTube and getting to interact more with um, people never in Scientology who support. I like to say on, on my channel, I started saying they've never in Scientology, but all in on bringing down the cult. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> but even comparing notes with other ex-Scientologists and ex Sea Org members, because there's something about realizing that someone else shares your crazy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there you go, is. Oh, like when we were talking earlier, we were talking about the big box stores and how we both had to kind of overcome that. Mm -hmm. It is just so nice and it's so neat. And I've gotten very recently, I'd say in the last few years, more comfortable with somebody giving me something and just being okay with that, like appreciating it. Cause that is the exchange, the appreciation, yeah. the acknowledgement for what that person does for us. It doesn't mean you have to give them a gift in return. Now there are times when, you know, there's, there, some people still will have that expectation, mm -hmm. but it is a beautiful thing to get out there and, and figure it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Some, and uh, you know what I think? What? I think you should write another book <laughs> because you've been out of Scientology now for how long? Um, Like almost 20 years, like 19 years. Yeah. Well, a lot of how my book ended was me coming out of Scientology. And to be honest, at the time I was like kind of covering for a lot of people. Like I was like, Dallas's family were great, but it was difficult. And I'm like, this sounds horrible how I'm introduced today. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, I was just trying to make it seem like we left and it was great. And it doesn't talk much about what happened after we left or after I left, which yeah. is just yeah. kind of its own thing. It's even almost more interesting and scary and crazy. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that is such an interesting part because it's a question I think we're often asked is that transition. How you make yeah. that transition? Susan said something brilliant here. 
After having been a controlling marriage for 27 years, I realized I didn't know what my favorite ice cream was. <laughs> That's Not so that. interesting. For me, Susan, it was bread. <laughs> mm. I didn't mm. know when I was able to choose or toothpaste. Mm, you know, that's so I interesting because I was just so used to like well what do you want because I was just right. used to making do with whatever I got whatever I had and yes. like, oh, I have that I mean sure it's a bunk bed and I'm on the top third one but it's a bed I mean <laughs> yes yeah or every decision's for the greater good or what's most efficient oh, I have God, yes <laughs> yes well, that's my actual problem with the big box stores. Like, I'm like, if I have to go from one end to the other and then I have to go back, I'm like, no, this yeah. is not efficient. Yeah, exactly. My Tony hears that from me all the time. He's like, why did you do, well, why would you do it that way? I'm like, because it is the most efficient way or we'll be <laughs> going somewhere. And I put it into the GPS. I check it on ways and I'm like, okay, this is the route we should take. It'll get us there the quickest and we will avoid this and this. He's like, yeah, but if we go this way, we can go around the lake and see it that way. I'm, I'm like, that is not efficient. <laughs> so he's been, I have been learning that there's this thing called pleasure. <laughs> you experience so, it even when it doesn't make sense. Like even yeah. when it's not the most efficient thing to do. Yeah. Just I mean, I know it sounds weird saying this and hopefully you guys are tracking with me. I know you are, Jenna. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's like, you don't have to feel guilty about feeling pleasure. Uh, yeah. yeah. When it's not the most efficient, efficient way to get to the pleasure. Like, you know, yeah. it's like, like getting to some place that's going to be fun. Well, we should take the most direct route. It'll be the most, you know, save the most on gas or whatever. It's the most efficient way of doing it. And totally. just being able to break through that, I know, is something that I still will struggle with. Even Tony will say, what do you want for dinner? It'll be like, well, what are the leftovers that we need to consume? <laughs> He's like, <laughs> I didn't so ask him that. I said, what did you want? I'll go, okay, what do we have? <laughs> He's like, I didn't ask you that. That's what true. What do oh my gosh, you're saying all these ways that I didn't even realize I was doing that, but you're so right with the leftovers. And yeah, because it's the most efficient thing and there's nothing yeah. wrong with eating leftovers and not wasting, but there is something inherently not organic and natural and normal for a human being to make decisions constantly based on the most efficient way to do it. Why? Right. It's like it's your duty. Yes. It's like yes. it's our duty to do what is the right thing that makes the most sense because you can check the most boxes. Yeah. And this is something that I've been trying to learn how to do with Tony because he's got it down. I'll be like, well, why, why are you doing that? I enjoy it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm not tracking. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's funny. I mean, even just like with my ex, there's just like, cause he didn't, he was in Scientology, but he didn't grow up in the Sea Org and he went to mostly normal school until high school. Yeah. And, um, his point of view is always like, everything's going to turn out. Okay. And he, and I'm always like, what kind of idiot would just be sitting around acting like that's going to happen? If you want things to turn out okay, then you need to get up, move your ass and make that happen. You can't sit around to, for the world to just like act like everything's going to be okay. Cause guess what? It's not, it's going to get, yeah. but he's, he was right. Everything is, does always wind up. Okay. I guess, yeah. but it was just such a difference an opinion or difference in just way of outlook on life that yeah. one caused so much unnecessary anxiety mm -hmm. and the other one caused so much unnecessary calmness. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. There's something about just, and I've learned about this in the last few years. And I think it's helped me a lot is the idea of disconnecting from the outcome, like, or the idea that knowing what we want, knowing what our goals are, knowing where we want to go, where we want to be, and just knowing it and feeling it and looking at it and eye on the prize, but not being so hung up on how we get there. Mm -hmm. Because things can happen. You know, things like when I, my mom may be late by 10 minutes once and I avoided this massive accident that mm -hmm. happened 10 minutes prior. I mean, you just, you don't know. So I no longer, I don't get upset if a flight is running late. I don't get upset if I'm stuck mm -hmm. in traffic. 
when those things are thrown in now, for me, I just look at it as, you know what? Well, then I guess this is where I'm supposed to be. And then, you know, make the most of that. I once got stuck in this town in Iowa because our car broke down, driving mm-hmm. from Minnesota down to Missouri. And I ended up having one of the best times of my life meeting these local people because it's just like, well, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And just, and they were, you know, and I talked to different people and it was just, you can't, I know for me, I spent so much of my life being so stressed out and I still struggle with stress in a big way, but being so upset and not feeling in control and feeling controlled, like somebody mm-hmm. else holding the remote that I'm yeah. like, I don't want to spend one more day hung up on a bunch of BS, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. No, that's so true. Yeah. And it's interesting how it manifests in different ways with different people. Like, so I notice with my kids, I'm like, you know, I guess it could go either way. I could take my upbringing and be super controlling, but I'm like the opposite. I probably need to be a little bit more controlling with them. (laughs) So it's like, almost like, it's just interesting how it winds up manifesting in different situations. You go one way or the other. Yeah. Grab a couple questions here. But first, thank you, Sandra OT420, for becoming a, uh, for joining the channel. <laughs> I love that name, OT420. <laughs> I'm going to be achieving that later. Trailblazer Laura, Jenna, this is a super chat for you. What is your theory of why your Aunt Shelly has not been seen in public for such a long time? Um, I just think that. Um, Previously, her job was to be the assistant of my uncle, and I think that that's no longer her job. You know, maybe she got in trouble or something, but I just think that it's no longer part of her job to be in public anymore. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, Larry B., this is a super chat for you. It says, made first donation. Woohoo! I love it. Amazing crew. Oh, thank you. (laughs) And that's Larry I don't know if I grab this one. Peaceful activist, thank you. Hip hip hooray to you for becoming a member. Uh, oh, someone's uh, Steph the writer. Sorry if this was said. Is your book on Audible? Yeah, it is. Okay, she's got five credits, so you can go grab that Ooh. book. Steph. Go <laughs> grab it. Uh, Buddy's dad, Conroe. Conroe. Uh, Jenna, what do you think of David Miscavige and his handling of the cult of Scientology? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, I mean, I think that he is the leader of a cult and a um, which perpetrates terrible um, human rights abuses. And um, yeah, sorry, that's such a big question that I'm not sure exactly how to answer it. I mean, I think that he's a dick. I think that he. <laughs> <but> <laughs> He is. You're right. He's a horrible human being. I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to say how much is him and how much is Scientology. And it doesn't really matter. It's honestly both of them. And it's also the many other executives who are there that are perpetrating the same things. It's all, you know, it's all of it. It's all messed up. Absolutely. Dastardly saboteur. What is the difference between the RPF and EPF? I'll answer that. It's the Estates Project Force is boot camp for Sea Org members starting in the Sea Organization. The RPF is the Rehabilitation Project Force, the Gulag or the reprogramming you go into as a Sea Org member if you step out of pocket. The Gulag, I like it. Gulag. <laughs> Ali's mom is asking Jenna, how did you find SPTV? Who turned you on to it? Actually, I think that the first person who told me about it or pointed to it in any way was was Christy Gordon from Children of Scientology. Um, I actually didn't know about it before I was uh, getting divorced, and she told me about it. Wow, so you just learned about it over a year ago or about a year ago. Or less. Me too. <laughs> okay, <good>. <laughs> <laughs> I was like feeling bad. I was like, no. Yes. I was watching YouTube, but for RV and glamping videos. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I was like gardening videos yeah. and coding. <laughs> yeah. How to fix stuff around the house kind of a thing. That's all. And it was actually during, I think, when the Danny Masterson thing was really going on. And I came across Aaron's channel and then some other ones and kind of went from there. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Jan's asking, Jenna, what do you do now professionally? Um, right now I do web development. Cool. Yeah. Surrounded by Scientology sent you a super chat. Uh, great smile for you two top content makers. <laughs> oh, thank you, George. George is fabulous. He's fabulous. Lisa E is asking, Jenna, did you ever see Sterling or Justin in LA or were you at different bases? Um, in LA when I was in Scientology, um, no, I didn't. Well, actually when Sterling was leaving, I did see him. Um, but Justin was living in Virginia, I believe at that time. Uh, but I see Sterling now, Justin and I aren't close. We don't really talk. We haven't talked for years. Oh, okay. Um, Gemstar says new music from Lara FM and a new book from Jenna would be awesome. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I love Lara. Great. That would be great. Maria says gardening and coding. So cool. Coding is the best web flow forever. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra says, uh, Jen is an amazing human. She just gives off a calming presence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think you will find no shortage of support. And I look forward to just more of, you know, what you're going to do and do here on YouTube and otherwise and hearing about it and seeing about it. Panko sent you a super chat and says, Jen, I'm reading your book. Love it. I vote for a sequel. Really enjoyed this chat. Thanks to you and Natalie. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Granny G is currently listening to your book on Audible. Jenna, loving it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so great. That's, That's so really great. sweet. Yeah. And a reminder, wherever you're watching this, make sure that you hit the like button and be sure to get over if you're not already following Jenna. I just had it like all pulled up and I went and had to redo it again. <laughs> there. Jenna Miscavige, you can find her here on YouTube. Don't lose out. Don't miss out. I think this book thing is actually a great idea. I do. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll I think, see. I mean, you're hearing it from the people, you know, mm -hmm. Lori Place sent you a super chat. She says, Jenna, I'm so excited to know what the world is finding out that you really are as sweet as you seem. Come on back. We miss you. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> yes. It'll be so fun. You and I are going to get to hang in the <gasps> future. I know. I'm so excited. I just like, we need to like shenanigan it up. You know? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Shh, no, sure. And scream. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. It'll be so much fun. <laughs> a lot of big talk. We are both such rule flop followers. I know. <laughs> I get, you do this. I, I'll get to a pool somewhere and I'll stop and I have to read all the rules first. Meanwhile, Tony's canning balling into the pool. <laughs> That's not to do that. That's not to do that. <laughs> That's too funny. No, we'll have a good time. Yeah. If I don't read the rules, then I'm like better at working around it. But once I know it, I'm like, mm, I don't know. You can't let it go. Because <laughs> I have come to learn even really recently that for the, a very long time in my adult life, I realized I think I'm the only one following the rules. All these other people seem to just like their guidelines. Now, mm -hmm. on certain things, people don't go crazy. It's nothing crazy. But yeah, uh, Partytology sent you a super chat and says, Jenna and Natalie, which of the current mm -hmm. SPTV people did you guys know when you were in the cult? Huh. Um, I knew Serge and I knew Laura and I knew Sterling and I knew Aaron and I, I didn't know you. No, I was because I haven't been in the Sea Org for 30 years. Wait, is that right? I left the Sea Org in 93. So oh, yeah, that would be yeah. right. But I left Scientology just about 14 years ago. And so I was out of the Sea Org scene. So I mostly knew people who were just members of Scientology. It was a whole different kind of world. Mm, right. I didn't know anybody from as the current SPTV creators. I I knew people who, no, I didn't really know them in the Sea Org. Oh, yeah. I knew Mike Brown. Oh, yep. 
there, people are saying in the comments, they're telling me all the people I knew. <laughs> this is, you know, you know this person. <laughs> I know I knew more people. I just can't think of anyone right now. <laughs> but I did not. Well, me and Liz Gale knew each other as babies, but I don't remember her. But we were babies together in um, New Hampshire. Our parents worked together. Yeah. So we kind of New Hampshire. Oh, before your 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 parents went into the Sea Org. Right. Yeah. Oh, very cool. That is super cool. Well, we will definitely do this again. And everybody, remember to get over to her channel because she's gonna she's got some fun stuff coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. And it's so fun getting to know you too, because I would imagine, even though you've written a book, a lot of people haven't read it, the more they get to know you and see you, I think the first thing they're going to realize is that number one, your just ability to, to bounce back and to thrive and not just survive with everything that you went through. And it's also nice to see that even though you have the miscavige name, that that buttholeness is not a hereditary thing. <laughs> That you know of, yes. <laughs> I fight a few people, but hey. <laughs> true. Why not? Yeah. Why not? All right. Well, Jenna, you hold tight. Thank you so much for doing this and sitting Thank down. You. We will do it again. And uh, everybody else, get out there and have an amazing cult-free day. <laughs>